Revelation 12 Nuremberg Connection, Part 4, The Absurdities of Modern Science, How the Copernican Revolution Set the Stage for the End-Time Great Deception. Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation, and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Nikola Tesla Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of 2 or a factor of 10, we call that horrible. We say, something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of 10. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120. That is 1 with a 120 zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. That's Michio Kaku. Modern science today is based entirely on works of Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Lael, Darwin, Huxley, all men who put forward ideas directly contrary to scripture. So where has that led us? We'll start with cosmology, the foundation for all the other evolutionary quote sciences, falsely so called. The Revelation 12 Nuremberg Connection, Scientific American. Cosmology has some big problems. The field relies on a conceptual framework that has trouble accounting for new observations. Written April 30th, 2019. Modern cosmology is in serious need of a reboot. Compounding this problem, most observations of the universe occur experimentally and indirectly. Today's space telescopes provide no direct view of anything. They produce measurements through an interplay of theoretical predictions and pliable parameters in which the model is involved every step of the way. The framework literally frames the problem. It determines where and how to observe. And so, despite the advanced technologies and methods involved, the profound limitations of the endeavor also increase the risk of being led astray by the kind of assumptions that cannot be calculated. He goes on to say, A key piece of the Big Bang paradigm was criticized by one of the theory's original proponents for having become indefensible as a scientific theory. Why? Because inflation theory relies on ad hoc contrivances to accommodate almost any data. And because of its proposed physical field is not based on anything with empirical justification. This is probably because a crucial function of inflation is to bridge a transition from an unknowable Big Bang to a physics we can recognize today. So, is it science or a convenient invention? He concludes his article by admitting, In order to maintain a mathematically unified theory valid for the entire universe, we must accept that 95% of our cosmos is furnished by completely unknown elements and forces for which we have no empirical evidence whatsoever. What is taught today as fact is really nothing more than unproven ad hoc theories based on presupposition delivered from outlandish conjecture which itself was contrived by sheer fantasy, all of which ends up beautifully illustrated by the hands of artists and published in textbooks as self-evident truth. If you want to see how bad it's gotten and where we are with the quote-unquote science of cosmology. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? And, and anyway. By the end of the 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble, working with the large 100-inch telescope atop Mount Wilson outside Los Angeles, had established that our galaxy was only one of many galaxies in the universe. When we look out at other galaxies, on average, they're moving away from us. And those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast. And those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast. 
And of course that makes us look like we're the center of the universe. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous in a sense to the ancient conception of a central Earth. This hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it is unwelcome and would only be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. The unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. Several decades ago, we found a problem, a problem so great that it was brushed under the carpet for many a decade. And this is the fact that galaxies spin too fast. In fact, 10 times too fast. By rights, the galaxy should fly apart. Therefore, scientists said that we have to have dark matter, a halo of matter that surrounds the galaxy and holds the galaxy together. And what have they discovered? Absolutely nothing, zilch. What is a little bit perturbing is that after 50 years, we still haven't found what the dark matter is. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means they're harder to find than we thought. We look out in the universe and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste. And it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really we should be calling it the dark force. Because we don't know if it's made of matter. It could be a profound misnomer, sending people off in thought directions that might not really be uh, the right path. So dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing, responsible for 85% of the gravity of the cosmos. It is the longest standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Dark matter, dark energy. Everything we know about the universe, what we're made of, galaxies, stars, planets, that's all right here. So, according to this chart, we are 96% stupid. So the problem with cosmology is that we keep inventing theories, uh, ad hoc theories, to try to explain the data, such as inflation, dark matter, dark energy, and so on, just to keep patching the theory up. There is a crisis in cosmology. Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of 10, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of 10. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120. That is one with 120 zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. Really? <laughs> 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 wow! Woohoo! Beer mug hyperspace multi bubble verse. Really? Mm, beer. <laughs> Seriously? They're farting out beer bubble universes. Okay? That's what they're doing. Hey, I got an idea. Yep. Multi beer bubble universe. And they call that science. And they make fun of us? Really? Yeah, I'm not going to take that from them anymore. I'm not going to sit here and let people who think they came from monkeys out of a beer bubble universe ridicule me for <laughs> looking into what I'm looking into and considering, you know, a possibility. If you guys can think about beer bubble universes, then I can think about a snow globe. Fair enough? Okay, let's move on. What is the shape of the earth? Remember what Yeshua said, Matthew 24, 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered them, and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. Strong's Concordance 4105 Planeo means to cause to wonder, to wonder. Short definition, lead astray, deceive. 4105 Planeo Properly go astray, get off course, to deviate from the correct path, roaming into error, wandering, be misled. It is also the root of the English term planet, wandering body. This term nearly always conveys the sin of roaming into sin. To cause to wander, 4106, plain. 
Short definition, a wandering, fig, deceit, delusion, error, sin. 4106, it is a feminine noun derived from what God says is true, an error, deception, which result in wandering or roaming into sin, i.e. prompting them to also stray from God's circle of safety or sound doctrine. 4108, planos, wandering, leading astray, deceiver, Misleading, a deceiver, it also means imposter, derived from planeo, wonder, a deceiver, trying to get others to also veer off God's course or path of safety. 4107, planetes, it's a masculine noun derived from planeo, to wonder, properly a wandering star, planet, figuratively a false teacher, operating without moral compass and exploiting other aimless people. So whenever we say quote-unquote planet Earth, we are saying the wandering, deceptive Earth that leads others astray from the circle of Yahuwah's safe truth. Keep that in mind. But even in the early 20th century, all initial observations, even at high altitude, were of a flat, non-rotating Earth. Consider... Popular Science Magazine, August 1931. What did the first man to reach the stratosphere have to say about the Earth's shape? It seemed a flat disk with an upturned edge. Dr. Augusta Picard, 1931. What is the shape of the Earth? The first men to reach the stratosphere. Sky violet in color at 11 mile elevation. Soaring in their airtight balloon gondola to the record breaking height of 11.8 miles above the Earth. The other day, three Russian aeronauts brought back the first scientific observation ever made at such great an altitude. Above their heads, the sky provided a striking spectacle. Its color had turned to a soft, deep violet, almost devoid of the light-reflecting haze found at lower levels. Looking down, they tried in vain to detect any curvature of the Earth's horizon. Following their successful voyage to the stratosphere in the gondola illustrated above, still higher ascents are planned. It also says on the right, it seemed a flat disk with unturned edge. A couple of years later, the Russians got to 62,304. You can even start looking into more recent government publications. You'll find some interesting stuff, such as... We go forward about a decade to the 1940s, 1948. This is an official CIA, look up here, CIA.gov, okay? CIA declassified document from the Russians. I'm going to pull it up here in Adobe Acrobat. It's a little easier because I've already highlighted some stuff here. Same document. All right, so the subject is Earth Measurements, 1948, Moscow, Russia. Outer gravitational field and shape of the physical surface of the Earth. They're trying to figure out the shape of the Earth? Wait a minute. I thought we knew the shape of the Earth since Pythagoras and Eratosthenes, right? Well, apparently the Russians didn't get the memo. A study is made of the coordinates necessary for the solvability and uniqueness of solution of an integral equation by the aid of which the outer gravitational field and the shape of the physical surface of the Earth may be determined. So we go through this document a little bit here. Uh, it says the methods of studying the shape of the earth. So this is what their goal is here. They're outlining some of that. The shape of the physical surface of the earth can be determined with sufficient reliability on the basis only of data obtained from exact measurements. Well, that goes without saying, I suppose. And let's keep going down here. Let's see. We can regard the potential of the real earth by this equation here, apparently, as known correct to an additive constant at all points of the physical surface of the earth and only on the surface whereas it is not determinable at all other points of space without knowledge of the shape of the earth so they're still trying to figure out the shape of the earth here but since the shape of the earth is not known the shape of the earth is not known 1948 the true coordinates of these points b l and h are unknown to us so the russians we're having trouble figuring out the shape of the earth in 1948. Let's look at another document here. Another declassified CIA document up here, right? They're checking out the firmament in this one. Let's go back to Acrobat. 1953 now. 
Geophysics Light Scattering, USSR. I'm trying to figure out how does light work in the atmosphere here. So we get down to page 19 here. It says, Dissertations Defended in the Scientific Council of the Institute of Physics of the Earth, Institute of Physics of the Atmosphere, and Institute of Applied Geophysics, USSR, 1957. March 1957. Looks like March 23, 1957, apparently. The dissertation represents the result of many years of study of the clear daytime sky. The observations were carried out in 12 locations at various altitudes above the sea, various climatic, meteorological, and synoptic conditions. The observations were carried out mainly during high transparency of the atmosphere in the visual range of the spectrum in the absence of a snow cover. In the investigations, two instruments designed by V.G. Fezenkov were used. One of these was a visual photometer of the daytime sky intended for measuring the brightness of the firmament. Hmm. Interesting. Trying to figure out the brightness of the firmament. Again, 1957. The dissertation contains a certain formula of the brightness of the sky, taking into consideration only the brightness of the first order and derived, get this now, on the assumption of a flat earth and giving some conclusions derived on the basis of this formula. So the Russians are trying to check out the firmament based on assumptions of a flat earth in 1957? Very interesting, huh? How old is the earth and how do we know? Uniformitarianism versus catastrophism. From 1830 to 1833, his multi-volume Principles of Geology was published. The work's subtitle was An Attempt to Explain the Former Changes of the Earth's Surface by Reference to Causes Now in Operation. He was, along with the early John Playfair, the major advocate of James Hutton's idea of uniformitarianism, that the Earth was shaped entirely by slow-moving forces still in operation today, acting over a very long period of time as opposed to catastrophism, an idea of abrupt geological changes through violent action. Thus, he looked at the stripes in the rock and assumed millions of years of erosion. Today, this is the accepted view of geology, but how accurate are our dating methods? How old is the Earth and how do we know? Uniformitarianism versus catastrophism. Emmanuel Velikovsky's World in Collision, also Earth in Upheaval. These books show the vivid documentation of cataclysmic evolution. Origin of Multicellularity Hmm... Gender is fluid? When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single-letter differences were easy to tally. But the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes, or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. Made out of a blob or in the image of God, the late Nobel Prize winner Professor Francis Crick, OMFRS, along with British chemist Leslie Orgel, proposed the theory of directed panspermia in 1973. A co-discoverer of the double helixal structure of the DNA molecule, Crick found it impossible that the complexity of DNA could have evolved naturally. And so the idea of panspermia was born. The idea that ancient aliens must have seeded our world to kickstart evolution. And this is now becoming the new standard. Thus, when asked what if intelligent design was a plausible solution to the evolution of man, this is what Richard Dawkins has to say. 
It sounds very laudable to, to, to teach the controversy, to teach both theories, but there aren't two theories. There's only one theory around. There's only one, one game in town as far as serious science is concerned. Of course, you get negative reactions from creationists, but who cares about creationists? They don't know anything. We're Johnny Come Latelys. We live in the cosmic boondocks. We emerged from microbes and muck. Apes are our cousins. You don't believe that the Earth is round only if you're an astronaut. You don't believe Napoleon existed only if you're a historian. You believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. You have, uh, you have written that uh, God is a psychotic delinquent invented by mad, deluded people. No, I didn't say quite that. I said something rather better than that. Oh, well, please tell us what you said. Please tell us what you um, said. I, well, I would have to read it from, from, from the book. No, please. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. So uh, you believe it's liberating to uh, tell people that there is no God? I think a lot of people, when they give up God, feel a great sense of release uh, and freedom. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone nor else. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. Believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that I'm, higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. Many, many people are extremely illogical. I'm skeptical of the claim. I'm skeptical. 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 I'm skeptical of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination. 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 Of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged.
Thankfully, there are many in the scientific community finally taking at least a skeptical approach to Darwin's bogus theories. But if you've seen the documentary Expelled, you will note how hard it is for scientists and teachers to buck this system. NASA estimates 1 billion Earths in our galaxy alone. Study says 40 billion planets in our galaxy could support life. Our galaxy might be home to 10 billion Earth-like planets. There could be up to 10 billion warm and cozy Earth-like planets in our home galaxy, new research reveals. 8.8 billion habitable Earth-sized planets exist in Milky Way alone. And we have NASA and other space agencies constantly trying to get us excited about other Earth-like planets out there. A question of origins. When it comes to belief, here are our choices. In the beginning, Yahuwah created the heavens and the earth, and he made us in his own image. Or, in the beginning, nothing farted out the heavens and the earth, and we got here from goo to you by the way of the zoo. Or, in the beginning, nothing farted out the heavens and the earth, and E.T. seeded the goo to make you. When you proceed from a false premise, your conclusions will tend to end in sheer madness. And so the idea of panspermia is now mainstream. The idea that ancient aliens must have seeded our world to kickstart evolution, this is now the new standard. A question of origins. When it comes to belief, here are our choices. We can believe what our education taught us, a round ball, or we can believe a pear-shaped Earth, or we can believe NASA's composite images. Or we can believe in the enclosed earth, let God be true, but every man a liar, Romans 3, 4.